Okay, Genesis chapter 6. <clears throat> you know, we are living in interesting times as you look at the world. And we can almost just kind of, if the world, well, it is a map, you can almost point in any location and say, oh, that's going on over there and that's going on here and that's going on there. You know, and there are signs of the end of the world. Signs that God is coming back to rapture his church and to begin the tribulation period. Uh, in fact, I hear more about the book of Revelation today than I have in a long time. Uh, more teachers are talking about it. Uh, uh, it's being broadcast on podcasts, radio, and so forth. Uh, many of the Christian pillars in our uh, community today in the world are talking about this being the last days and so forth. And so... The question I guess we need to ask ourselves is, do we really believe that we're living in the last days? Do we really believe that? Now, it's easy to say, yes, I believe that we're living in the last days, but not really believe it. Well, what do you mean? Well, if you believed it, if you believe that we're in the last days, then your life will reflect that because you understand the urgency that we're living in. You understand that we need to get the gospel out to our loved ones and neighbors and friends in the world. You need to understand that you need to be right before the Lord if the Lord came back right now. And he could. There's nothing holding him back. If we really believe that, we'll, we will get into the wheelbarrow in a sense. You heard that story, right, about the guy who went on a tight rope across Niagara Falls? And he walked across the tightrope and he walked all the way back and the people were like, wow, that's amazing. And he said, you think I can push a wheelbarrow across the, the rope? And they said, yeah, we know you can do it. And he'd take a wheelbarrow and push it all the way across and bring it all the way back. He goes, you think if I put somebody in it, I could do that? And they're like, yeah, we believe it. He goes, okay, I need a volunteer. Nobody volunteered. They really didn't believe it. They didn't want to risk their lives for it. And so we really need to believe it. Now, let me give you some scriptures that talk about the days of Noah that were like the days of Jesus that I believe are like the days today. In Matthew 24, we'll get into the text in a minute, but just listen to this. Matthew 24, 37 through 39 says, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, now before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus said those words. And so he said, like the days of Noah, before the flood, everyone was... On their Nintendo, well, it's not even Nintendo anymore. On their iPads and on their computers. And they were at the movie theaters and they were enjoying Disneyland. And they were doing all the things and marrying and giving in marriage and partying and all of that stuff. Going on with life and careers and college and all this stuff. And then all of a sudden the flood came. They did not really know. Is that the day today? Sure sounds like it. Listen to what Peter said in 2 Peter 3.3. 3. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days. Now, I have been a scoffer from time to time because there's been times in the past where I would hear teachers say, we're in the last days. And I'm like, you know, how many times have I heard that? How many times? I remember when I first got saved and there was a book going around. Some of you might remember you were back then. I got saved in 1987 and, and shortly after that, probably around that April because it was January 7th of 1987 that I got saved and there's six of us in our family bringing God in his seventh number completion. I thought that was neat, three sevens victory. So I'm like, wow, I'm just blessed to even be uh, saved. And then this book is written, 88, 87 reasons why the Lord's coming back. And when I read that book, because I bought it, it was for a buck. And this guy was selling millions of them. And I thought, the end is coming. I'm a young Christian. The end is coming. And I was prepared. And I was doing everything that I knew I needed to do to get the gospel out, to tell people, my family and friends. I mean, I was excited the Lord was coming. And then 87 went by. I'm like, oh, okay. 
And I've always heard in the studies, you know, don't believe in it because we don't know the day or the hour. You know, we know all of that. And I just, I just thought maybe it could be, though, you know. And then the guy decided he's going to make more money. He's got 88 reasons why the Lord's going to come back in 1988. And he sold millions more. And I didn't buy at that time. <clears throat> so there's been times where I thought, oh, Lord, we've been saying this for a long time. Yeah, 2,000 years, right? And we're still saying it today. But we're one day closer and here's the thing, we don't know when it will come, just like we don't know when death will come, yet it can come like that to any of us. And so we need to be ready. There are scoffers in the last days, and we, we, we can name a lot of them that are out there scoff, scoffing against Christianity, walking according to their own lust, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they wrongfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were made of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. So he's using that as an analogy. Like today, the Lord could come in any moment, just like those who were standing in water and were filled with water when it flooded them instantly so the Lord could come back. The last days before Jesus will return will be so similar to today's uh, day and time and, and events that are taking place. It's just ridiculous how close we are. Let me break this chapter up for you just a little bit so you get a better idea of what we're going to look at. We're going to look at the wickedness of man that's going on in the world at that time in verses 1 through 7. And then we're going to find within all this judgment, within all this, this sin, within all this chaotic mess, God's grace that's given to Noah. One man who is walking with God and then his generation, uh, his three sons and then the promise of the flood that will come and we'll see that in chapter seven and the building of the ark. So this, more, this evening's theme is carnality. Carnality. What is carnality? It's living in the flesh. That is what carnality. It's what the Corinthian church was going through. They were living after the flesh. They weren't living for God they were living for their own desires. They were doing what was pleasing to them and not to God. It was fulfilling the desires of their eyes, the lust of their hearts, uh, the wants of their minds. It was all carnality. It's, carnality is, is fleshly. It's not spiritual whatsoever at all. It may disguise itself, but it, in reality it is not. So let's look at the wickedness of the world. Now it came to pass... When men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them. Now, from chapter 5 to chapter 6, it seems like there's, there's this great uh, amount of time that has taken place because the earth began to populate, multiply. In fact, there has been some calculations that have suggested that they have billions upon billions, possibly more population than we have today. I believe in 1965, we exceeded, what, 6 billion people on the face of the earth, and yet they had way more than 6 billion people. Now think about that for a second. 6 billion people, that is a lot. 7 billion, 8 billion, 12 billion people, that's men, women, children on the whole face of the earth. And this is all happening back over in that area in time. That's a lot of world that's, that are doing a lot of bad things, evil things, wicked things, and God is going to judge them all except for one family. That's like a grain of, of sand on the beach, you know, and you're going, wow, all of that will be destroyed except one grain of sand. That is amazing that man was that wicked. And, and, it, and it's sad, and it is a tragedy to see such beautiful lives destroyed because of their will to sin instead of loving God. That's the sad part of it all. And we'll see that that's God's heart too. That the Son of God, verse 2, uh, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all who they chose. Now here's where the big debate is, right? Genesis chapter 6. Who are these sons of God? They definitely saw the daughters of men, which many commentaries believe that the daughters of men are just the daughters of the world. 
These are the daughters of Seth. These are the daughters of Cain. These are the daughters of Adam and Eve. All those daughters. But the sons of God saw the daughters, that they were very beautiful, and so they chose themselves wives, whoever they desired or want. So who are the sons of God? That is the question because there are several possibilities here. Now I'm just going to right away just get rid of this one. Uh, some think that they're aliens. They must have been aliens who, who came down and they uh, chose themselves uh, some women from the earth. Now that is totally out of the picture. They can't be aliens. Nowhere does the Bible ever speak about aliens from Genesis to Revelation. Um, there's no such things as aliens because aliens would exist before Adam and Eve and there was no plan before Adam and Eve. The, the covenant of the, the, the sacrifice of, a, of an animal for a covering and so forth. I mean, there, there's a whole theological problem there. So there's no way that it could be aliens at all. This makes no theological sense uh, at all. So we can just throw that one right out the right out the door. So there's two possibilities, and I'm going to talk about those two possibilities. Now, the, the offspring of the sons of God and these daughters, we're, we see in verse four. Look at it. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of gods came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those who, or those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. So the offspring of the sons of God and these daughters were giants, huge people. There are several possibilities. Now, when you just read it, just from the text itself, one of the first things that pops out to you is unequally yoked. They're just unequally yoked. They're not both believers in God. One of them doesn't believe God. The sons of God don't believe in God and the daughters are the believers in God. Kind of like uh, um, Cain and Abel, right? Abel offered up the sacrifice. God received it. Cain offered up the wrong sacrifice because it was his own sacrifice. It was his own idea of what pleased God and, and he wanted to live by his way and his will and so forth and God rejected it. And Cain killed Abel and God gave grace to Cain by marking him so that no man would take his life. That's grace. And so it could be that the sons of Cain married the daughters of Abel. And it kind of makes sense. Now, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, this is going to get some of you, especially you younger uh, believers here. The Bible says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness? What Paul is saying here is don't have a relationship with the opposite sex that doesn't believe like you believe. Very clear. And, and, and it's not a suggestion. It is a commandment. I've argued with many people over this scripture. But, but what if I could save them? You can't. Only God can save them. You have nothing to do with that. Now, you can be their friend, and hopefully you can witness and share with them, and then hopefully the Lord will save them. And then down the road, like 10 years from now, then possibly, you know, there might be a relationship there. And I'll tell you, that that can happen because it happened with uh, one of my sons, uh, Simon. He met his, his wife in high school. His wife was not a believer. She pursued him, and he just ignored her completely. And one day, she sent, you know how they are in high school, she sends a friend to tell him, don't you know that she likes you? Why are you ignoring her? And he says, because she's not a believer in Jesus Christ. He made it very clear. And so from that point on, she, <laughs> she was determined to become a believer, you know, and so she started coming to church, you know, she was attending as a friend, and that was it, and she ended up getting saved. And they didn't get married until probably 10 years later or so uh, after the, knowing that she was saved and she truly had a commitment to Jesus Christ and so forth. So that's possible. But immediately, Paul says, no, don't even pursue it. Uh, you should not be in an unequally yoked uh, relationship. Now, the reason of the judgment was the mixture of the heavenly family with the earthly family of the daughters. And that definitely could be a possibility if a believer decided to marry a non-believer. 
And it seems that sin multiplies more quickly when that happens. I have seen it over and over again. When they decide, again, here's free will. I don't care what Paul said. I don't even believe that's what it says. I'm going to do what I want. And so they go ahead and marry a non-believer. And then what happens is, is that non-believer drags them down and they now start living like the non-believer. I see that happen more often than the other way around. It does happen periodically, but don't take your chances just because it may. God already gave us the commandment not to do it. But it just seems like when there's unequally yoked relationships, it is very difficult. Uh, I know there are a lot of people even in our little church here who struggle because their spouse is not a believer and they're not living for God. And so it just brings pain and suffering in the relationship. So, so if that was the case, then that would make sense why the world was the way that it was because it was becoming evil Uh, marriage the marriage more easily becomes diluted and eventually uh, desecrated today believers need to remember not to violate paul's principle of being unequally yoked to unbelievers Um, the sons of god though secondly might be angels the fallen angels who decided to marry into the human line Now, that's an interesting thought. And there have been many, many books written upon this. The big problem is the identity of the sons of God, whether they're angels or not. Is there any evidence in the scriptures? Well, the phrase sons of God in the Hebrew is benah Elohim. And every time benah Elohim appears in the Old Testament, it is a reference to the angels. And so there's a possibility there that, that Moses is referring to angels here when he says sons of God. When you go to Job chapter 1, you remember that Satan was in heaven. If you read the book Job, and he's walking to and fro. And this is what it says. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to the presence themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. So the angels, the sons of God, and Satan were in the presence of God, Job tells us. Job chapter 2 verse 1 says, again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also was among them. So twice they say this in Job. So is it angels? But how can angels, unbodied spirits, have physical relationships with a human person how is that even possible didn't jesus say that angels neither marry or are given in marriage in mark chapter 12 he said that so if angels are not given in marriage then how can they have relationships with human beings here's my idea and this is my idea and i have to make that very clear but doesn't make it biblical you can just throw it right out the door but what if the angels possessed the body and then the body was used to marry these girls. That's a possibility, but again, a supposition on my part. Let's look at angels. Angels are divided into two major groups. The exalted angels around the throne of God, and we see that in the book of Revelation, who do the work of the Lord, and then the fallen angels, which we call demons today. Lucifer was an exalted angel who led the rebellion against the Lord in heaven. And by the way, that means Lucifer had free will. He existed and was created by God, and yet he had a choice to serve and worship God or to rebel against him, and he chose to rebel against him. When he fell, he became what we call the devil, right? Revelation tells us one-third of the angels, uh, angelic host, um, also rebelled with him. Uh, Peter may have read Genesis chapter 6, and he talks about it in his writings in 2 Peter 2, 4. Listen to what he says. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, now he could be talking about the sin of rebellion while they were in heaven and he had to cast them out, or he could be talking about the sin as the sons of God with the women of the earth. But cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved into judgment and spared not the old world, but saved Noah and eight persons, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So he's saying here, these angels who who fell, he judged, and that brought in the flood. 
So it could be a reference to, to Noah's situation here in Genesis chapter 6. Jude also talks about it. Jude verse 6, there's only one chapter, Jude verse 6. The angels which kept not their first estate but left their own inhabitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness into the judgment of the great day. These angels were so bad, God had to literally send them somewhere. These are the angels that will probably be released in Revelation during the tribulation period to go out. It could be these angels, a special group of angels that had the ability to uh, have relationships with women, earthly women. And then what about Exodus 19.4? Uh, this brings up an interesting thought too. You remember the men of Sodom and Gomorrah there and how they saw the angels come to Lot? And they knocked on the door and said, we want those men because they wanted to have relationships with the men. So somehow these angels had a body, whether they were possessed or what, we don't know, but they had a body. And the men of the earth wanted to have relationships. It was the homosexual relationship that they wanted to have and the very reason that God judged Sodom and Gomorrah. So that brings up another interesting question. I'm just throwing questions out to you along with us, right? Uh, now, it's true that the phrase Son of God does refer to angels in the Old Testament. Definitely, we see that in Job and other places. There is one place, though, where it does refer to the children of men, but it's in the sense of being a judge in Psalms 82, 6. He says, I said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High God. Now, when he says you are gods, what he's saying is you are judges, not that you're a god. And, and Jesus refers to this when he's talking about um, um, being God, when he claims to be God before Abraham was, I am, and he's talking to the religious leaders, and they're like, how could you, you know, uh, be before Abraham, you know, was, and so forth, and then he says, well, did I not say that you're gods, but he's using the sense as judges, and so they judge as a God would judge, but most of the places that it, that uses the phrase sons of God is referring to angels. I don't know if we'll know does it really matter? It's good study. Is it sound theologically? I'm not sure personally. Um, you have debates on both sides. I'm kind of leaning towards the angel possibility, but it sure sounds like the other. The only problem with the other is why would they be giants, you know, and, and deformed? Uh, that's a problem there if they were just men of Cain's ancestry and Abel's. So the possibility is angels. And we see throughout history in, in various cultures that there were giants. In fact, I, I remember reading an article recently, too, that they had found some, a skeletor of a big giant, you know, that was very unusual. So it could be. Does that change anything? No, it just tells you uh, how corrupt and wicked angels are, you know, and what they will do to destroy mankind. And we need to be aware of that definitely and, and put on the armor of God and, and understand how they work and tempt us, especially uh, tempting us in our free will to do things that we shouldn't be doing, especially when you know you shouldn't be doing it. But you're struggling in your heart. You're struggling with, with the flesh and battling against it because the flesh so much desires to, to go in the way of Cain in a sense. So. So Moses goes on in verse 3 and says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he indeed uh, is flesh. Uh, in other words, debased, hopeless. Yet his days shall be 120 years. Now, why 120 years? All of a sudden, uh, they were living for hundreds of years, and now God says 120 years. It could be because of the evilness that was going around. God says, that's it. I, I can't let you go that long. It's just getting worse and worse and worse. And when you have a society growing that big and continues to get worse, it grows. Uh, you look at the, you look at any, any, any of the moral issues today, whether it's abortion, whether it's uh, homosexuality, same-sex marriage, all of those things. They started somewhere, right? And they got enough, even look at our presidency. Uh, back in the Cold War, communism and they kept track of people right because they were uh, leaning towards communism as being the thing that we should be doing here in America all those things those all those things started somewhere and they grow as people come and they convince them indoctrinate them and tell them this is the way to go so whether it's communism and now we have a 
a president that's a socialist in a sense and almost communist, a dictator in a sense, doing what he wants to do and just writing it all out and who cares what anyone else says. And people support this. Lots of people have bought into that. Uh, abortion also, the right of a woman. You know, but what about the right of an unborn child? We, we just totally neglect that. Uh, people buy into that. You know, the homosexual thing, again, they, they buy into it because, you know, all of the lies and, and so-called evidence and so forth, but yet they discard what God says about it. And I think what God says about it is more important than what anyone else says about it. What does God say? God, God all over scripture says homosexuality is abomination. He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. What more evidence do you need? Killing babies? Bef you know, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. You're special. You have a purpose and a plan. He has a purpose and a plan for every one of us. And why would we abort a child? That's murder or communism. He created this great nation of ours on the constitution that was based upon the biblical principles. Biblical principles. And yet you have people saying, that's not true. We have a lot of our forefathers who were atheists, you know, and that's not true. That's a lie. It's just a lie. And they're apt to lie because they want their way. So, again, it could be because of the fact that it was growing and multiplying. God says, all right, I'm shortening it to 120 days. I'm having grace. And he definitely was having grace, right, uh, to all those people. That it, you can imagine what they were doing, and yet God was giving grace, letting them by more and more, man, woman, child, until it was enough. He shortened their days to 120 years. <clears throat> now, there were the giants on the earth, verse 4, in those days, and also afterwards, and the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. These are what they call the Nephilims in Hebrew, or the fallen ones, literally, it may imply it may imply in Hebrew that it's not necessarily that they were giants, but that they were in a sense uh, great men. They carried themselves. They were wide. They were they were warriors. They were powerful in that type of sense. I, I'm not quite sure if that's true or not. It could be that that's what the word means in the Hebrew, but it really seems like these were giants. Who are these Nephilims? Well, we know they're the offsprings of the sons of God and the daughters here, the mixed union. And we find these stories, as I said earlier, in all kinds of cultures. They were the offsprings of angels and human beings. And it could be that they were the authors of all the evil that was going on at that time too. Then the Lord, verse 5 saw that wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Wow. Now you can't get any clearer than that. That means when they woke up in the morning and they went to bed at night, all that was on their mind was evil. Evil, evil, evil. All day long. Man, Woman, child, all day long. Sinful thoughts, sinful ways, selfishness, self-seeking, their will, not God's, all day long. That is a perfect description of an ungenerated soul. A man and a woman and a child who wants nothing to do with God, only to do with indulging themselves in their ways and in their desires. And we're living in those days today. Many of the commentators said this, and so I have to say this, <clears throat> because definitely a possibility that a lot of what was going on at that time in Sodom and Gomorrah is, is definitely an example of it, is this uh, abnormal sexual behavior that was going on at that time. You know, we can probably say today, and they do all day long, you know, everything's okay in our country. Everything's fine. Jobs are up. Everyone's got medical. What's wrong? We're, we're going forward. Yeah, it's costing some of us something. Those of you that work hard, and we're giving it to those that don't work at all, you know, it's costing us something, but 
isn't everything just fine in our culture? Aren't we growing as a society? Aren't we learning to love one another? But underneath that surface is a perversion in our society. And we need to understand that. The largest industry in America today is, guess what? It's not automobiles. It's not airplanes. It's not agricultural. It's not the uh, industries out there. The largest industry out there is entertainment. Entertainment. What does that tell you? That the whole world is all about entertainment. You know, Disneyland, Knott's Berry Farm. I say that because those are the things that are out here. Magic Mountain, you know, Las Vegas, the movies, the beach. It's all about how can I entertain myself? That is the biggest industry. Billions upon billions of dollars are being poured into entertainment. Do you know what is the fastest growing entertainment today? It's hardcore pornography. They're spending billions and billions of dollars on it. We no longer even question things like that anymore like we did in the old days. It's almost common now. In fact, statistically they say that your children at the age of six or seven have already seen pornography because of iPads, iPhones, computers, and all of that stuff. As in the days of Noah, so are our days. Our society insists that everything's fine, that underneath the surface lurks this horrible sexual behavior that will eventually sink us to in this world. And this clearly speaks of man's free will to do this stuff. Do you understand what I mean by free will? We have a choice. We have a choice to do these things. Every one of us has a choice. God has given us uh, that ability to choose. That is part of his nature, his image to choose. We have a choice to do evil or we have a choice to do good. Every Sunday you have a choice to go to church or not to go to church. You have a choice to read your Bible and find out what your God and Savior wants you to do or you have a choice not to read your Bible. We all have choices every day. That's called free will. And he gives it to us. And thank God for that because that tells us that our God doesn't force anything on us. He wants us to love him with our hearts, not to be forced to love him. And yet so many choose freely not to. Some of us do only evil continually by openly exercising our free will in rebellion against God. We, we have that choice to just rebel against no matter what. We rebel, we rebel, we rebel. And we continually rebel, just like in the days of Noah. Others of us do only evil continually by failing to acknowledge God and serving God. You know that human beings are not basically good. Human beings are, by nature... Adam's nature, sinful. And the Bible is very clear. If left alone, we will do sinful things. Look around the world. <clears throat> you can see good things being attempted, kind things being done, the homeless. Uh, I just got informed of a, <clears throat> a thing going on in our library over here. And it's uh, put on by a, a group of people that are trying to bring awareness to Africa and the poverty that's going on over there. That's a good thing. You know, you think about those. Those are good things. Look at United Way and, and all the good that they're doing. They're helping people. They're giving clothes. They're giving food. They're donating here and there. Those things seem to be doing good things. The problem is not with our attempts and our achievements. The problem is with the heart, though. Because those things seem to be good on the outside. What is the intent of all those things? Until we come to bow the need before Jesus Christ as king of the universe, our own agenda are just that, our own. Our own agenda is just that. It's our agenda. It's my offering, God. I brought it to you from the ground, and I worked hard for it. Here it is. Take it. That's my agenda. It's not what God will ask for. He asks for a lamb, just like Cain. We're without, when we're without God in this world, there's evil. So that means that, that even our best acts of kindness and goodness is nothing. So, so all the good that we do, 
for the homeless cancer, let's say AIDS, orphanages, you know, all over the world, those efforts will not carry over to eternity unless they're done in the name of Jesus Christ and our Father, and it's for His glory. I mean, let me put it this way. If our hearts are godless, we, we don't want God in it, and we don't even know God, then even our good deeds are just filthy rags because they are done by our own self-efforts and not through the strength of God's supply and not according to His direction. Even the most loving and giving among us leads to secret pride. United Way, look at some of the CEOs and how many hundreds of thousands of dollars they get. Of course, they want you to donate so they can give a few bucks here and there so they can have their hundreds of thousand dollars salary. There's an ulterior motive there, a secret pride there. You know, look at what I've achieved. Look at my name on the plaque. Look at who I've helped. You know, look at what mankind has accomplished. Kind of like Babel, you know, and, and how they built the tower and we're going to reach God, possibly thinking, okay, if God brings a flood, guess what? Our tower is so high, we'll just hang up the very tip and he can't, you know, flood us out this time. That's man's pride. And that kind of thinking, it's robbery. It's robbery of God's glory. God had made us, God given us the abilities, and we need to glorify him in everything that we do. Let us strive to bring glory to him in the name of Jesus Christ. That truly is a man and a woman who loves God. God wants our hearts. He doesn't want to be sorry at what he has created. You notice that he gets sorry. Look at verse 6. The Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth. He was sorry. Now, what do you mean by that, that he was sorry? It, it's not like he was, he was regretting making them. He was sorry that they got so bad because he had so much more for them. You know, he has a whole plan for you, a whole path for you that he sees with blessings and prosperity. And I'm not talking about wealth and materialism. Uh, a, a plan that will glorify him. And he's sorry that you took the other route that you went the other way when he had such a beautiful thing for you with all the beautiful gifts that you have and the beautiful way that you do things according to his will and yet you chose out of the way and that's what made him sorry. Sorry that he had to destroy them all. Sorry that he had to take his favor and grace away from them but it was their choice and what they chose brought the judgment upon them. God did not force that on them. Because God doesn't change his mind. He created man in his image and nothing's changed. He loves man, but he's sorry that they chose that completely. <clears throat> you know, my emotions may be sorry for having to discipline my children, right? You ever feel like that when you discipline your children? But my mind knows that it's the right thing to do. Because if I don't do it, that child will grow up to be rebellious. That's why we discipline our children. And, and my prayer is, you know, God's not going to take, a, at least for us today, let's come today. We're under grace, right? Thank God. We're under grace. And so when we sin, we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us. And today he corrects us. He chastises us like children. And so I pray he chastise you because I love you. And, and if you're walking away, if you're thinking about it, if your mind is continually thinking of evil, then I pray that God will correct you and that he would correct me. And that he would discipline us because he loves us. And, and it will give you comfort because you know he loves you. That he would discipline you. That's what brings me comfort. But not judge you in the sense of condemning you. No way. I do not condemn you. You're saved by grace through faith. And it's not of anything you do. It's a gift of God. And you're saved. You're justified before him. But you're choosing the wrong path is what God is saying. And because they have chosen that path, they would be judged. And it says he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said in verse 7, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Now again, God, God is not altering his plan towards mankind uh, from being merciful and long-suffering. He is about 
to show himself as a God of judgment against sin. And this will take place again. We'll see when the second coming of God comes. God is more gracious than anything. As I said earlier, you know, Adam lived, what, 900 something years and his ancestors hundreds and hundreds of years and he just let them go on. Come on, repent, turn. Even when Israel went into bondage, you remember that, into, in, into Egypt? It was what, um, oh, 140 years, I believe it was, that they were in bondage. That, you know why they were in bondage that long? Because God was hoping the nations would repent. He was giving them time to repent, to turn to him, but they would not. And so he had to pull Israel and judge Egypt. <clears throat> Let's look at the grace of God in verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So Noah found favor. C.S. Lewis was asked, uh, what, was, what was the uniqueness of Christianity? And C.S. Lewis said, God's grace. That's the uniqueness of Christianity. There, there is no other religion out there that speaks of grace. I used to have a friend, of, friend, real good friend, and he, um, when I first met him, he was, I believe, a Baha'i, believed in uh, that Isl Islam, I think it is, Baha'i, or, or Buddha, one of those. And Hindu, Hindu, yes, you're right, Hindu. And um, that was when I met him. He had tried all other religions, read, he knew a lot about religions. It was funny because the only religion he knew nothing about was Christianity. And so I was able to share with him. And the thing that, that uh, really intrigued him was the grace of God. It was the grace of God. All those other religions that he tried and looked into all had works. It was all about works, what they could do to reach nirvana, what they could do to reach heaven, what they could do to have prosperity. It was all about their works. And it was Christianity that was God's favor on you. And that blew him away, that he could do nothing and God would still love him. God would still love him. That he could do all the wrong. And if he came back weeping, God would forgive him. That's grace. That's the grace that God had on Noah because Noah walked with God. Noah walked as Enoch walked with the Lord. He was blameless in the sense that his heart was bent to follow God and not give in to the flesh. <clears throat> this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation. Noah walked with God. Hebrews tells us that by faith, Noah believing, um, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. This is how Je Noah was justified because he believed God when God said, build an ark because I'm gonna judge the world. And so he built the ark, he obeyed him. That was accounted to his righteousness because he obeyed. What do we do today? The disciple says, what, we, was, what must we do to be saved? Jesus says, believe in me and you'll be saved. So we need to believe, we need to trust, we need to cling, we need to surrender ourselves to Jesus to be saved. That's what we need to do today. So Noah was sincere in his walk with God. He was open. Now, that's one thing I love about the Lord. You know, I, I know that my salvation is set because of what Jesus did on the cross. There's nothing I could ever add to his work. Otherwise, I, I dilute his work. It's done. So I am solid in my foundation in that. I don't worry. I don't fear about that because I totally put my faith in what he's done. But I also know that I have a walk with the Lord and that I have to be sincere in that walk, in my failures and in my successes. And so when I sin, you know, I'm like, I can't hide that from you. You know that I'm struggling right now. You know that I don't understand this right now. You know that I don't really care right now. You know, I've been through all those phases and yet he's always faithful to be there because he also knows I want to love him. I want to know him. I want to serve him. And I don't always do that, but he knows that because I'm very open with him in everything. So I, I walk with God with sincerity, openly. And I tell him everything, my deepest secrets, he knows. And he totally understands because ultimately I come to the very end, even in rebelliousness, and say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me of my sins because I know it's wrong according to your word. And I really believe that he forgives me. And that's how we walk by 
by grace. Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jetha. And we'll see them in chapter 7 a little bit more. <clears throat> and where Christ comes through the line, which is uh, Shem. Now the flood is promised here. It says, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. There's an, uh, another Another example of the last days is violence. We have more violence today than ever before. Look at the world and what's going on today. Back then, they didn't do anything about it. People were killing each other. Uh, you have to remember, there were no laws. There were no police force, no armies. God had not created the laws yet. Men were just living as God was directing them to live, and they chose not to, so they were killing one another. They were living the way they wanted to live, and, and so it was just a violent, violent way. anarchy. You can imagine a world without God, without morals. It's anarchy, total anarchy. And so it was violent, and people just accepted it. It was norm, and we see that today, don't we? I mean, we see many, many celebrating the beheading of certain people, videotaping it, broadcasting it, jumping up and down, yeah. I saw a video, and excuse me, but a little graphic here, but I saw a video because a woman did not wear her her, her whatever it is, veil. She had a veil, but it wasn't the right veil. She was out in the street, so the preacher got there, preached to everybody what she was doing wrong. And then when he was done, the guy comes up and boom, just like that, right in the middle of the street. And they're all, ah, la, Like, wow, it's celebrated violence. And what they're doing to little children, I mean, you can just go on and on, the murders of Christians, infidels, and, and so forth. And not just in this, these other countries, but it's coming to even to our country, as it is in Europe. And what? We're doing nothing about it. We're doing nothing about it. We're, we're having a meeting, like our president went out today to an Islamic place and said, Muslims have done a great, great job for America. We're doing nothing about it just like the days of Noah. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all the flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them and the earth, or I will destroy them with the earth. Now, how do you think Noah felt at that moment? I mean, imagine billions upon billions of people. Imagine today that God comes to you and says, that's it, I've had it with the earth. You're the only one that will be alive from this time on. Like, what? Are you kidding me? What do you mean everybody in the whole earth, even on the others, all gone? Noah believed God, and he did exactly what he was told to do. He trusted and had faith in Jesus Christ. That's why he walked with God. We need to do the same thing. It wasn't a surprise to Noah because he knew his God, that God was righteous and just. Now we see that he's supposed to prepare uh, the ark. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Uh, make rooms in the ark. Now, gopher wood, we really don't know what it is. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people believe that it's... Um, cypress wood but we really don't know there's no hebrew word for it so it's just a hard wood that's able to withstand moisture and water and so forth they were to make rooms in the ark uh, a nest is the word here so nest in the sense of areas for the different animals and and so forth some have even suggested like uh the gopher wood and and that uh, was made for Moses, that he was carried in like a weave type of basket. Possibly that was what uh, the ark was made of too, but we really don't know which one. And cover it inside and outside with pitch or asphalt of some sort that would harden and make it uh, leakless. This is the only time in the Old Testament where the Hebrew word keper is used for pitch here. It's also used for the word atonement, which is interesting because as they pitched the boat so that it wouldn't leak, it was covering the boat with it, right? In other places, it talks about atonement, the covering of God that's upon us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus atoned us. We're covered by his blood completely through his work. Now, in verse 15, it says, this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubics. It's width 50 cubics, and it's height 30 cubics. Now, a cubic, uh, 
usually was around the length from your finger to your elbow. And they say that's roughly around anywhere from 16 to 18 inches or so, or 18 to 20 inches, depending on how big of a person you are. So it's roughly around there. So the ark was roughly about 450 feet long. Now, you know my yard, those of you who have been to my house, double that in length and add 50 feet. So that's pretty long. And then it was about 75 feet wide. So again, my yard is 50 feet by 200. So 50 at another 25 feet. So that's how wide it was. Um, some have tried to uh, uh, say that it was like, oh, I don't know, about 50 or 150 um, train cars uh, hooked up together. That's how long uh, the ark was. So it was compartments, and it were to all hold animals. And it was designed basically to float. That's it. Not to sail, not to go anywhere, just to withstand uh, the, the flood. You shall make a window for the ark. Well, why a window? Well, basically for the smell, get some view. You have all those animals in there, so that makes sense. You shall finish it to a cubic from above, and he's talking about the center, the finishing part of it. So the top should be pointed to a certain degree, so when the water hit it, it just rolled right off made sense and so the and then there was a door set the door of the ark in its side so one door only that you can enter in and enter out uh, what does that speak of uh, the shepherds would bring the sheep into the sheepfold which only had one door one way in and one day out jesus said what i am the door and so there's only one way to the Father, and that way is through me. So it's speaking of Jesus Christ. And shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. So three stories. These three stories of the ark contain about 97,000 square feet of space. That's a lot of square feet when you think about it. Um, it's enough to hold all the animals that God is going to require to hold. It says, Behold, I myself and bringing floodwaters on the earth. Uh, floodwaters literally in the Hebrews would mean devastation upon the earth. And God makes sure that they understand that it's him who is bringing it. To destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath and life, everything that is on the earth shall die. That's man, woman, and child. Uh, if you saw the, the latest movie of Noah, I believe it was, with, uh, no? Some, what, what, uh, I'm going to say Kurt, Kurt Russell. It's not Kurt Russell. Russell Crowe. They, they, uh, some of the pictures in there are kind of like, ooh, you kind of, ooh. Because when the flood comes, and all of a sudden you see the people that are trying to grab onto the boat, and some get on the boat, and you know, and things like that. You can imagine billions of people being flooded, and animals too, just everything. You know, the fish would probably survive, some of the birds, but he's going to destroy it from under heaven, all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you, Noah. And you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. So he has a covenant. And covenant meaning uh, a covenant between two. And that is with God and him. So you have the noetic covenant. This is the second covenant that God has. The first covenant is with who? Adam. The Adamic covenant is with him. And that was part of the curse that he would bring a seed. This is the second covenant now. And of every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two, every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male, female, uh, of the birds after their kinds, of animals after their kinds, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kinds, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. And you shall take for yourselves of all the food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourselves, and it shall be food for you, for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded, so he did. Now, there are people that say there's no way that you can get all the elephants and giraffes into this ark and they do all this calculation, you know, how you're getting a male and a female and there's you know, just no way. And what they're doing is calculating adult animals and they forget baby animals. The, 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 uh, there's been uh, studies and they said probably the biggest animal is the size of a sheep. 
that Noah probably bought in. So you get baby elephants, baby giraffes, baby hippos, you know, baby rhinoceros. You know, they're all babies, and so they have plenty. They have more than enough room, as they calculate for everything. The worms can crawl in the cracks, you know, that type of stuff. Mosquitoes will find their little spot, and birds will be nesting in the rafters and things like that. So they have plenty of room. But notice again, Noah, and this is what I want to leave leave with you here, <clears throat> because we should be like Noah. Noah loved God. Noah had a relationship with God. Noah desired to please God above anything else. He wasn't following his neighbors. He wasn't following the latest trends. He wasn't seeking after all the entertainment. He was being faithful to God. And God saw that in Noah, so he spared his life. God blessed him. All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose, who have been predestined, who love him. And we leave that out sometimes, who love him. Now, I know you love him. You might be struggling in your heart and, and, and not knowing for sure, and you may be even doing things, but you know you love him deep down because you don't want to do those things. And he knows that, and he's working things out in your life. Be like Noah and surrender your life to him. And he promises that he will always save you. He will always protect you. He will always be there for you. And he will get you out of those tight, tight situations that, that you find yourself in and you know that it was God who got you out of that because he had faith in God and his Savior. <clears throat> Three things to leave you with. The flood demonstrates God's hatred of sin. God hates sin. And it will be judged. The wages of sin is death. And God is going to judge sin one, one day. Thank God his grace is here right now and we have the time to repent. Two, God's giving people 120 years to repent before judgment comes. He gives us our lifetime because we can be on our bed and we can repent and he'll forgive us. I had a situation years ago and someone asked me to go to a hospital visit. I went to this person. They told me this person cursed God, had nothing to do with God, never set a foot in church, you know, that type of thing. I went, and I just poured my heart out at how much God loved him. He couldn't even speak. And so I asked him to squeeze my hand. <clears throat> I said, do you know God loves you? And he squeezed my hand. And I go, you know that he has paid the way for you that he died, and I just shared the gospel, and tears were just coming out of his eyes. And I said, you need Jesus in your heart. And he confessed Jesus in his heart. And shortly after that, he passed away. Now you might say, what good was his life? What did it even bring? I'll tell you what it did bring for me. It spoke of God's grace. That even in dying bed, that you could be saved. That's amazing grace. It really is. So he gives us enough time to repent. <clears throat> but don't take advantage of that. Do it today. The, s the sparing of one family demonstrates of God's saving grace, that even if one were to turn, God would save them. 